Matt, please give me a warm Georgia Tech. Welcome to Matt, please. Good noon. Can uh, everybody hear me all right? So uh, thank you for having me this evening. Um, my name is Matt Faltzgraf, and I'm the founder and CEO of SoftGiving. And um, as I said, uh, SoftGiving creates alternative recurring fundraising solutions for nonprofits. And so you're probably thinking, like, what does that mean? And so in the uh, nonprofit space today, over 90% of donations are made in the form of a check. And so if you think about that, who writes checks? Uh, just kind of looking around the room, I'm guessing none of you. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever written a check in your life. How many, now keep your hand raised if you had to ask somebody how to write a check. And then raise your hand if you enjoy writing checks. So, so with the, uh, the check being the, the main source of, of revenue for a nonprofit, that, that limits the, the scope of which they can receive donations from. And it doesn't really set them up for the next generation of donors who uh, don't carry checkbooks around with them. Very likely they're only using checks to pay rent. Um, and uh, before, uh, prefer to use their, their debit card or credit card or more electronic forms of payments. Now. Uh, how many are familiar with Acorns? So Acorns is a uh, financial app that allows somebody to donate, or excuse me, to invest a rounded up change into a savings account that then they can use at a later date. And uh, the reason why Acorns exist is because people aren't very good at saving money. And what we did at SoftGiving is we looked at some of the different financial technology that was out in the space, looked at the old models, looked at the new ones, and tried to you know, complete them together to form a new way to give. And uh, today we do that and work with nonprofits all around the country, from as small as kind of mom and pop shops that raise ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year, to uh, some of the largest nonprofits in the world that raise over one point three billion dollars a year. And so uh, today, I'm going to share my uh, entrepreneurial uh, journey of how I got to create SoftGiving. And not, not necessarily spend a whole lot of time talking about SoftGiving itself. Um, I'll do some, some more of that towards the end. But the, the journey of, of starting a business, of coming up with an idea, of, of sticking your, your neck out there to try to create something, uh, has many, many different paths. And a lot of those that go on to create businesses really come from various different backgrounds, various different experiences, uh, often don't share much more than just a, uh, a complete lack of fear in, in going after the idea that they have and a determination to, to really stick with it and, and carry it out. And so I have, I have a little bit of an unusual story uh, that I'm going to share uh, of how I got to create soft giving, and um, I'm going to kind of just share just different things I learned like along the way, different uh, projects and initiatives I took on, different successes and different failures. Uh, really, feel free to raise your hand at any time if you're confused um, or have questions about what I'm talking about. I'm going to mention a part about detasseling, which I know nobody in here probably knows anything about and will probably have questions, but um, I'll just kind of jump into it. So again, uh, soft giving, um, fintech here in Atlanta. So uh, I grew up in Ankeny, Iowa. And Ankeny, Iowa is a, a little town outside of Des Moines. And when I moved there when I was a little kid. We, uh, we were not farmers, but we did have a farm field in our backyard. And so we got the, uh, the best of both worlds where we had indoor plumbing, but could also go play in cornfields. And so growing up, it was, uh, it was a little bit of a challenge. And so we moved a lot when we were younger. I had a dad that would constantly lose his job and have to find a new one, very uh, unreliant. Um, which made life difficult. And then when we moved to Iowa, my parents 
got divorced, my dad moved out of state, and it was up to my, my mother to raise my brother and I. And she was doing so um, all by herself because we didn't know anybody in Iowa. We didn't have any friends or family. We had just moved there the year before. She was tired of uh, moving and uplifting uh, my brother and I uh, to different communities, and so we stayed in Iowa. And she would go on to get her associate's degree so that she could get a job as a, as a secretary, uh, which now they call executive assistants. And so in order for her to do that, um, being a, an executive assistant, a secretary, you're, you're not earning a whole lot. And, and doing that while going to college full time, or excuse me, part time in the evenings, and having two little boys, you have to have somebody to look after uh, my brother and I. And so we relied heavily on nonprofits. And so in the mornings and afternoons, my brother and I would be picked up to school, uh, going to the Boys and Girls Club. In the mornings, we played basketball, uh, kickball, um, played pool, foosball, all different kinds of activities. In the evening, we would um, get picked up from the school, taken back to daycare, uh, and that's what we did. Like, that was just like a normal life for us. We didn't think that we were receiving nonprofit services. We were just uh, living our lives as you know, young boys. Uh, at the same time, like, we'd spend our summers going to the YMCA and going to different camps around the state. Um, and again, like we just felt like that was just like a normal part of growing up. We would get our clothes and bikes from the Salvation Army, and so we didn't have like the flashiest uh, clothes for school. Our bikes had constant chains that would fall off, and we'd have to become kind of uh, amateur uh, bike mechanics if we wanted to make it to school on time. Uh, we got our dog Brownie from the Animal Rescue League. Uh, Kind of through and through, like in order for us to have a functioning familyhood, we had to rely on nonprofit services. And a credit to these nonprofit services, we didn't know that we were receiving really handouts. We just thought we were living our, our normal lives. And so that was uh, really what growing up was like. And, and through being at these nonprofits is really how I got my first uh, taste of being an entrepreneur. And so uh, when, you're, when you're young um, and, and going to the Boys and Girls Club in Ankeny, Iowa, something that all the, the boys did was trade baseball cards. And we had stacks of baseball cards that we would trade like we were uh, stockbrokers. We'd uh, keep track of all the prices in this book called Beckett, uh, look up every month to see if our Cal Rickman Jr. had gone up in price or if our Frank Thomas was like holding steady. Um, and we go to the baseball card shop with any like extra dollars we have, buy that pack, and you know really hope to catch that uh, Fleer Ultra, you know premium, premium uh, Dikembe Mutombo. Um, I took it a step further at one point, and so I figured out that if I set up uh, a game of dice where I'd have three dice and I'd line up a, a roll of baseball cards, and so I'd start from three all the way to 18, and I would put a real expensive card at the front and a real expensive card at the end, so the three and the 18, and then I would charge other seven, eight, nine-year-olds $2 for a chance to roll the dice to see what card that they would win. Now, in the middle of it, I would just load with just garbage cards. And so I'm... I'm doing this because I know so the, I, I could figure out the statistics at the time of like what the odds were of somebody rolling three ones, or the odds of them rolling three sixes. And this is a classroom of, a lot, I think, a lot of engineer students, so I think we can figure it out collectively like what that is. Can somebody tell me what the odds of rolling three ones? Is this Georgia Tech or Georgia? <laughs> Nobody? 216? 216? It's about 3-4%. About so, so the odds are very slim. Uh, so needless to say, I, I made out really well. I made out really well that there were about 15 kids that I cleaned out their uh, lunch counts uh, for the week. And 
When Friday came along, uh, their parents were all very upset that I had taken in about $50 in lunch money that week. And, and I had already spent it to like resupply my baseball collection. <laughs> and so you learn like, you know, cash on hand, you know, you got to put it to work. So you got to reinvest in your business to grow it. And so that's what I was doing. I was buying better incentives, so I knew that I would get more people willing to pay more to roll the dice. Now, my, um, my dice operation got shut down. Um, I didn't have to repay back anything because I didn't have anything because I'd already spent it. But I did have to offer a lot of very sincere apologies. So this was really like my first uh, step into being an entrepreneur. And so I saw, I saw the market, I saw the demand, I, I created a product, and, and we exchanged, you know, the, uh, I exchanged the money for the goods, and, and I became wealthy from it. Uh, now, when I couldn't rely on my uh, illicit gambling operations, um, like I had to work like a lot of jobs. And so growing up, I had to eat tassel corn. And so that meant in the summers, getting on a bus at 5 in the morning, being dropped off in the middle of a cornfield, walking up and down the cornfield and taking the tops of the stalks off and, and putting them down uh, through rain, uh, through, um, through uh, humidity, I mean, through everything. I had to walk through water that was up to my waist, get bit by bugs. I, it's, it's the worst work you can imagine. Uh, but it's kind of like a rite of passage in Iowa. So I did that for a while. I was a janitor when I was in uh, high school for a little bit of a hospital. Uh, I made pizzas. I washed cars. Uh, when you turn 16 and you get a car, getting a job at a car wash is perfect because you can keep it clean all the time. Uh, worked an ice cream place uh, where I put on like 15 pounds in like four months. Uh, <laughs> Worked at a bookstore, uh, delivered newspapers, worked at uh, Home Depot, and uh, bus tables. And so from the age of 11, uh, I started working because we didn't have extra funds of, like, available. I mean, it was, again, like just the three of us. And, and we lived in a house that was uh, built in the 1950s that got water in the basement whenever it rained. Anything that we wanted, like we had to earn. And so the only way to, to get those was to, to go to work. And something about doing all these different jobs and, and, and learning along the way is that each different experience, like you're constantly taking in like different lessons that you're learning. And, and you're able to apply it to, to future things that you do uh, down the road. And a diversity of experiences is how innovation is really created. And so through the work that we do at soft giving and things that I've done previously, the, the innovation comes from small ideas being cobbled together and to form a new idea. And whether it's figuring out the most efficient way to get through detasseling corn or uh, making a pizza or how to effectively uh, hit my newspaper route to deliver papers in the fastest amount of time so I can get out of the blizzard that's coming, like everything like applies to itself. And so one of the important things I think to, to think about like, at your age and, and at your level of experience is, is truly trying like many, many different things. And, and things that might go counterintuitive to what you're trying to do is work and is a, is a career goal, but all eventually flows into what you will eventually be doing and, and builds those uh, soft skills that you otherwise wouldn't see and be able to participate in. So. Um, so I got, I got the work ethic down. Like that's, that's the first important piece of it. Uh, the next piece was uh, discovering leadership. And so when I was in high school, I was very soft-spoken. I sat in the back of the class. I didn't raise my hand for anything. I didn't go out for, I didn't play sports. Uh, at one point, I had like longer hair, dyed cardinal red, and I skated. Like, <laughs> It was really, really cool at the time. Like Limp Bizkit was like awesome. Um, Lincoln Park, I don't know. <laughs> Just to give you an idea. Uh, so, 
so my first time dabbling in leadership. So we have this annual senior bash every single year where um, it's just basically a big kegger thrown at the end of the year. And for like my high school, it had been uh, canceled temporarily because the location had been outed and therefore like we couldn't have it because we didn't have a location. Well, I'm hearing people talk about it and I'm thinking, you know, I, I know how to throw this party. Like, I've never thrown a party in my life. Um, I don't really know like the cool kids and so talking to them like wasn't really something I was like naturally doing, but I had an idea. And so what I did is I stood up, or I, I approached the person that had access to the kegs and I said, look, I know how to operate this, this party. I, I know this field that's isolated, that nobody knows the location of, and so nobody can give out the address ahead of time. So that's step number one. Like, don't give out the location because then if you give it out, people are gonna find it and they're gonna shut it down. And then step two was getting people to, to the party. And so what I did was I coordinated a series of caravans that would leave the Home Depot parking lot in my town of Ankeny and would have to follow a driver and nobody was given the specific directions of, of where they were going. They were just going to this town called Madrid that is spelled like Madrid, but in Iowa we call it Madrid because we're <laughs> fancy like that. And, and so you'd have these lines of caravans of all these uh, broken down Pontiacs uh, drive into this field where um, they would then be offloaded and then they would get into like a separate vehicle and then be taken to the location. <laughs> I mean the logistics was you know cumbersome but but we figured it out and so we had this this party and about 300 people attended we went through you know all the kegs you can imagine and it never got busted everybody got home safe uh, police never came uh, it worked out well the next morning we had our school orientation, or not orientation, our, uh, it was graduation orientation. And of course, like, I slept in a little bit um, from, from putting in like long hours the night before. And I show up to our high school gymnasium uh, late and my whole class is like clapping for me. And I knew 90% of them did not even know my name, but it was kind of like the first kind of instance where I'm like, I can do leadership things. Like, I can, I can figure this stuff out. Like, if I, if I can do it here, then I can, I can manage this. And so, I mean, it was a great feeling because I didn't think I was capable of leading. Uh, so that really is like the t-shirt from the Senior Bash. I still have it today. Um, I'm not like holding on to memories or anything. It's just, uh, it's a comfortable t-shirt. Um, so, so I get through that uh, and then I get to kind of this awkward stage where like I'm done with high school, like I graduated but I was never a great student. I got C's and D's and just did enough to get by. And so everybody has these plans for like what they're going to be doing when they graduate. They're going off to college, um, around the state, around the country. I go to my local a community college where the president was just arrested for manufacturing drugs in their basement uh, with their family because they were all in on it. This seriously happened and uh, and so uh, one we need to pay our presidents of community colleges more um, and and you need to have a, a plan when you graduate high school and so uh, I was just kind of floating around. I was just kind of doing what I was doing in high school, not really, grad not really working that hard, just kind of going through the motions just to get through class. And then um, one uh, weekend, went with some friends to the University of Iowa where we were playing Wisconsin uh, for the Big Ten Championship, and I got to go tailgating for the first time. And I thought, this college is fantastic. Like, why didn't anybody tell me about this? And so I was just so enamored with like the college experience of tailgating and going to a football game that I went back to my community college and I'm like, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to a university. So I studied, I made Dean's List the next semester and I got into Iowa um, just because I had a great time at a tailgate. <laughs> 
And, and this, was, this was just the mindset of me at the time, which um, is demonstrated in this next picture. So this is me, my first, uh, first week at the University of Iowa. It's not a mugshot. I've never been arrested before. <laughs> Um, the, the separation of the chin and the mustache beard was like the style at the time, I believe. Um, and not having like a uh, fully functioning pair of glasses. But, but the reason why I show this is, again, like, every, all of this is like a path. Like it's a very long, like kind of winding, very awkward path. And, and I didn't come from like a background to to be, um, you know, churned into like a CEO, right? Running like a fintech company. Like I went to college because I liked the parties, and and I thought it was I thought the girls at the universities were more attractive than at the community colleges. Um, but but the lack. I mean, regardless of like the motivation, like those are the, like kind of the the random trigger points to 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 change behavior and and kind of took me on a little bit of the path I'm, I, I've been on ever since. Now, uh, when I got there uh, and I was around like other people that were like, healthy, working out, working in school, trying to better themselves, you know, then, then my behavior changed. And, and I reflected those of those I surrounded myself with. And so I started running. Um, uh, shortly after this, like, I, I ran my first marathon. Um, I started uh, going to class. I started participating in uh, extracurricular activities. I started trying to be um, who, who I thought you know, I couldn't be, but I thought I'd try anyway. And so what that led to me doing was uh, going out for mock trial. And so when I was at the University of Iowa, I went out for mock trial. And I was super excited because I'm like, you know, I'm going to be an attorney someday. I'm going to be litigating all these great cases and really make something of myself. And so I went and tried out for mock trial, and they said, we don't want you. And I was devastated because I thought mock trial was going to be a lot of fun. And so at the time, I was like kind of... Uh, you know, a little bit sad about being turned down, but then I'm like, you know what, they practice in public areas. Like, I'm just going to show up to their practices anyway. Um, and so I did. And so a friend of mine uh, was friends with one of the managers on the team. I got the schedule of like when they practiced, and I thought, hey, they're making a mistake here by not picking me to be on their team. I'm going to show up, and I'm going to help in any way I can. And, and just do what I'm told and, and see what happens. And so after showing up for a few months, they eventually asked me to, to be on the team. Now it was the D team, and they only had three teams, A, B, and C, but I was still on the team. Uh, and so doing that, like I continued to show up and put in like the work, and, and they, they recognized that. And so then I became the manager of, of that team. And we went to a tournament. And, and we won. And we became the first, uh, first team um, to, to win this tournament. The first, uh, we were the only uh, team at the University of Iowa to win a mock trial tournament that year. And, and it wouldn't have happened if, if I would have just like been told no and just stayed home, right? Because that would have been like really easy for me to do. It's like I tried, I went out for it, it didn't work, I, now I'm done. But I went out for it, I tried, they told me no, I kept showing up anyway, um, and, and the hard work uh, paid off. And, and that's kind of a lesson that continuously happens and has happened to me throughout my, my career. I get told no all the time, like all the time. Uh, and, and I never look at like a no as like a real no, like when, when working or in business space or anything else like that. Like that's, that's like the first like no. But if you, if you get rejected for something and you keep working at it and you keep trying anyway, the person that initially told you no will eventually recognize that. And, and then they'll see something in you that you didn't otherwise show when you first tried out for whatever that, that thing was. 
And, and that's how you build credibility. That's how you build trust. And, and that's what was happening when doing mock trial. Now, my experience in mock trial then led to one of the other mock trial participants running for student body president. And I didn't know him that well. Uh, his name's Barrett Anderson. He's to my, my left in the picture here. Uh, he, he, didn't, he was running for student body president, didn't know what he was doing. I, I was really good at um, learning things very quickly. And so I ran into him at a bar at like one in the morning, said, hey, let me be your campaign manager. We, uh, we made an agreement right there at the field house. And, and he said, OK. And so then I came on to be his uh, campaign manager for his student body campaign. I instituted professional uh, campaigning strategy. And so I walked around the 16 blocks of campus and I wrote down every address uh, in that radius and created an Excel spreadsheet that then became the, the knock book that we used to target students to get them to vote in the student body election. And so that's the same uh, strategy that you see in political campaigns today. And so they have uh, what's called the voter activation network um, on the Democratic side. And it has like a list of every single person that's registered to vote, where they live, what their age is, all of these very, just various different demographics. And they're able to target that and keep track of their data. Well, that's what we did. And so by doing that, we were able to then get our, our voters out to the, to the polls. And in that election, there were 8,000 people that had voted, and we won by 80 votes. And so instituting something into like a, a different ecosystem like, was what put us over the top. And what, we, what I learned there and, and what, I, again, I continue to apply today is every other student body election, what had taken place is people would do bar crawls, people would hand out flyers, people would do Facebook messaging. And that would be it. Like that would be the extent of their campaigning. Where what I wanted to do was like look at it from the ground up and say, if we were to create this from scratch, like what would we do? Like what would this look like? And that's where instituting the door knocking and the, the follow ups and all that came into play. And, and that's why we were successful. Now going from that, um, I, uh, I got selected to be the government relations liaison in student government. This was a position that did not exist before, but again, just because something doesn't exist doesn't mean it can't exist going forward, and so they created it for me. And my responsibility was to look out after student interest uh, on, on public policy issues. And so one of the things I worked on was I was walking around campus, and I went to Pita Pit, and they offered me a free Pita if I signed up for a credit card. And they said, you know, sign up for this Alumni Association credit card. Uh, every purchase you make will benefit the University of Iowa. And I'm like, don't care about that, but I would like a free PETA. <laughs> and, and so I signed up. And, and then I started thinking about that interaction. I'm like, that's like a really weird thing to be able to do. Like offering like a free PETA to give somebody a, a line of credit. Like that, that just seemed like unusual to me. So. In my capacity as a government relations liaison, I started requesting contracts from the university about their relationships with, with the credit card companies and how they were able to market these solutions to students. Because they were handing out t-shirts, uh, towels, hats, anything you could think of all over campus saying, sign up for this and it'll benefit the university. And you're doing a great job to support the uh, Hawkeyes. And what I had uncovered was that the, the university was using the Alumni Association as kind of like a shadowy kind of intermediary between them and credit card companies where the university was then agreeing to sell your information to the credit card companies so that they could target you um, dozens of times in a semester. Not only like your information, but your parents' information. And for each student that signed up for a credit card, the university athletic department would get 50 bucks. Now, this campaign that they were doing, over uh, about 215 students had signed up for it. And those 215 students had amassed a debt of $275,000. 
And when I talked to the university and the alumni association about it, their response was, well, you know, students have a lot of debt, you know, anyway. Like, this isn't that much compared to what they're already getting. Which is a really horrible response um, to, to anything. But, but it just showed, like, how, like, rampant the, the predatory lending space was in, in credit cards. And, and it also just showed how, how removed it was. And so what I did is I, I tried to talk to them and tried to reason with them. And when that didn't work, I went to the, the press, and it became a, a front page story in the Des Moines Register, which is the largest paper in Iowa. It then kicked off this investigation by the uh, State Government Oversight Committee, where they called hearings on the predatory lending. Uh, I was asked to testify at those hearings uh, prior to the University of Northern Iowa and Iowa State University agreed not to uh, target students anymore with credit card lending and, and credit card marketing. And then five minutes before I went on, uh, I was told by the University of Iowa that they would no longer uh, be marketing to, to students at the University of Iowa and that they were ending their relationship with Bank of America. Now, Iowa became the first state to, to ban credit card marketing to students on campus. And then through our work, we then worked at the federal level, and now it is uh, illegal nationwide to, to market credit cards to students on campus uh, as part of the, uh, the Credit Card Act. And so just to kind of rewind a little bit, so I, I would not have gotten into this position if I had gone to mock trial and they told me no and I would have just gone home. Like, that's, that's the series of events that really push that. And if you want to rewind it even further, if I had not gone to, to this really awesome tailgate um, and watched the Hawkeyes beat Wisconsin to win the Big Ten Championship, I, I wouldn't have gone to school. And so, kind of as you're on your, your career path, and especially if you're hoping to be an entrepreneur, like, there's going to just be very random turns that, that lead you to where you are. And, and what's always difficult is to kind of see like what's at the end of the tunnel. Because all you can really see is like what's in front of you, what that struggle is like right now. I mean, everybody in this room, um, I mean, especially those on their phones, like I know you're just studying right now really hard for like your upcoming final, um, are taking notes diligently. Um, but you're not thinking, you know, you know, a month down the road, six months, you know, five years. I mean, it's really hard to, to comprehend that. But, but what you're doing and how far you extend yourself and, and what you push yourself to do will ultimately determine like where you end up. And, and your path always starts with what you do in the, in today, you know, what you choose to do with your time, uh, where you choose to, to spend your energy. So, so with uh, uh, so with this, um, I have another story, but I probably don't have time to tell it. Um, interest of time, but so I did this. I, I did some other things on campus at the same time. Like it was, it was, it was just like a, it was a thrilling experience that gave the the confidence to keep pushing forward. And so, I never graduated from the University of Iowa. I. I was, a, I was still, even while I was doing this, I was a horrible student. Like, I was getting D's and C's. Uh, my best class was called football physics, um, where it was just basically like Bill and I, the science guy in the front of the room, like doing science experiments the entire time, and you were just learning about mass uh, by, um, by like weighing apples. It was great. Um, but, um, I was kind of like energized, and so I was on to like my, my next thing. And so I knew I didn't want to be in school anymore, but I didn't really want to get like a real job. Uh, so I decided to run for office. Um, <laughs> and I thought, all right, campaigns last. You know, if I, if, I, if I run early in the year, I basically got the whole year just to run for office. I don't, my parents aren't going to expect me to get a real job in that time frame, so it'll be fine. So, so there was an opening back in, uh, at the, back in my hometown of Ankeny, 
Uh, it was an open seat. The, the, the state representative was uh, retiring. And I, I looked at the numbers, and I thought they were daunting, but I thought, eh, I'll give it a go. So, so I announced uh, that I was running. Nobody cared. Um, I, uh, I had a primary opponent. I, I worked uh, to circumvent them and, and uh, to kind of cut them off. So I, I rallied support of those uh, that I could to uh, encourage them not to run against me. Um, and they eventually didn't. So I won the nomination for my party. And all of a sudden, like, I'm on the ballot of the, the general election. And so uh, at this time, I was 22 when I started doing this. Uh, turning 23, and and I thought, you know, I'm going to do this like I want to do it like my way, like the way that it feels right. And so, looked at like the numbers that we needed to hit. Like I knew I couldn't raise like a ton of money because I didn't know anybody that had any money, and why would anybody give me any money? Um, and so, what ended up happening is um, I focused on just working really hard. Like that's that's always the default setting is when you don't know the answer, or if you can't outsmart it, just work really hard. And so me and another volunteer knocked 15,000 doors uh, in the election. Uh, he was 65 years old and lost 30 pounds door knocking. <laughs> he got stung by two bees and, one, and it got bit by one dog. Um, and what ended up happening is through all that work and determination, I ended up getting the most votes in Iowa State House history for a candidate who did not win. <laughs> so uh, you don't really get much when you get second place in an election. Uh, there's no like secondary government that you get to run. It's not like if you run for state representative and you don't win, you get to be on city council. Um, but, uh, but what I got a chance to do was one, I was terrified of, of public speaking before I started running for state representative. But going and door knocking, I was forced to speak to thousands of people and have a stump speech that I had memorized so deeply in my mind that I could, I could literally, I'd wake up in the middle of the night saying it. Um, I could probably still recite it today, but I'm not. Um, a lot of the issues are like, outdated anyway. Um, but learning how to fundraise, like learning how to organize various different groups together, having to really think on your feet. When you're at a door and you're saying you're running for office and you're asking them for your vote, uh, you don't know what they're going to say. Um, I had people ask me about uh, turning the airport into a drag strip. Um, I had people asking me if it was like possible to get uh, tattoos banned. Um, like spinner, spinner rims were like a really like big issue for people at the time. Uh, all these different things that somebody's coming to you with, and you might not be prepared, but you still have to answer them in a coherent way. And, and that's what I really learned uh, through that. Um, so I got second place. Um, and uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, like towards the end of my election, so at this same time as I'm going through kind of all these kind of pieces in my kind of collegiate career and up to here, like I still have, like there's still personal things going on that, that you have to deal with. And, and I had a father that, uh, who, who really went from not being able to keep uh, a job to then really developing some serious uh, mental health issues and uh, eventually, like, it led to, um, to him uh, taking his own life. And so three weeks before my election day, I got a call from my, my mom saying that I needed to come home, that something happened to my dad. And I get home, and uh, you know, when you get a call like that, you fear, fear the worst. And, and unfortunately, it, it came true. And so. Um, he, uh, he was somebody that I got a lot of um, uh, kind of my, I would say, kind of my how I think through things like from him. And so him like taking his own life like was very tragic. Um, 
at that same time, like three weeks later, like I lose the election, and then three weeks after that, my stepfather, who was really the person who raised me, um, had a heart attack on the day before Thanksgiving, and had and we spent Thanksgiving in the hospital as he went through a quadruple bypass surgery. So uh, through through these various you know different you know either disappointments or tragedies, you know you. You still, you still have to kind of go about your life, and you still have to, to keep, keep, keep moving forward, but these are things you can't account for. Like, these are things that you can't plan for. Like, it's always going to be a random phone call that you don't expect out of nowhere that really comes, that really knocks you off your feet. And, and there's no class to prepare for it. There's no training for it. It just, it just happens. And, and really, all you can control is how you respond to it. And so, um, after he he passed, I I ended up kind of dialing back, kind of like some of my ambitions. Like it didn't feel like it was, uh, you know, you don't really feel like putting your kind of foot to the metal when things around you are are unstable because you're already taking a lot of risk. And when you have even greater risk kind of compiled on top of you, it makes it even harder. And so I went back and um, basically I got like a normal job is, is how I put it. And so it was a nine to five job where I worked with different school districts and cities around the country. Uh, this was uh, around the, the Great Recession. And so a lot of them were struggling to balance their budgets. And so I would work with them uh, and the team I was on to get some financial stability in what they were doing. Uh, Worked with uh, Detroit Public Schools, St. Louis Public Schools, City of New Orleans, like some of the real um, kind of rough spots in the country at the time. And so I did that for a little bit, and then I just got kind of burnt out on government and uh, needed something else. And so I just kind of randomly applied for a job at uh, this company called Shazam. And I thought, you know, this is a really cool like, music app. Like, it's going to go a lot of places. I'll be able to listen, you know, be a part of this new technology uh, that's being deployed out there, of being able to take sound waves and turn it into music. Well, it turns out there's also another company called Shazam that does pin debit networks. Now, that's like the most exciting part of it. Like, um, and so they do payments. And, and payments are excruciatingly boring. Like there's there's nothing exciting. Like us as consumers, I didn't even know payments was like an industry. I just thought you just swipe your card and things happen, <laughs> right? Like you don't think about like the routing. You don't think of um, when I was applying for this. I uh, was being asked like what the ODFI you know was, and I'm like googling it like on a phone interview. Like, oh yeah, originating depository financial institution. Yeah, <laughs> who doesn't know that? Um, and so I ended up uh, getting the job, and I was hired as the director of the Shazam Regional Payment Association. So I was one of 12 directors around the country that oversaw the rules, regulation, and technology of ACH payments. And it was a very irresponsible job for them to give me, having my, my background. But they did give it to me. And so because I, I knew uh, it was going to be challenging, I spent my time um, researching and really mastering my craft. Uh, eventually was then asked to be public speaker at a number of conferences around the country. And uh, that led me um, into you know, being recognized as kind of one of the younger experts. Uh, as part of this association and those 12 that I was with, I was probably the youngest person by 25 or 30 years. And so it allowed me to look at payments very differently. Um, so there's a picture of me speaking. That's me with uh, Frank Abagnale Jr. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the movie Catch Me If You Can. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio plays the, him. Uh, but that's a real life version of him. Um, he now works for the FBI. It was really nice. So um, I did that for like a while, but then like the itch to like disrupt things like just kind of kept building. And it's really like when you're used to like people being upset with you for things you're doing and trying to stop you like at different turns, when people stop doing that, you you miss it. And and so 
I was uh, on the board of a number of nonprofits. I saw that they were having a lot of trouble raising funds. I was uh, really bad at raising money because I, I still didn't know a bunch of wealthy individuals. And so when I would go to raise money for my peers and I would say, hey, would you like to donate $500 so you can get tickets to the uh, Wing Ding barbecue? I didn't sell any tickets doing that. Nobody cares. Um, and so I thought there was like a huge disconnect between the financial tools that were available to donate for younger people versus, versus older. Uh, everybody else on the board, they could get their peers to go and write checks. Uh, I, I could not do that. So, so that's when um, I thought, you know, it's now time to, to, to get back out there. And so I, um, I put in my two weeks notice. I, I didn't even have like a, a company formed. I had like a, a, a vague idea of like what I wanted to do. Like I just wanted to disrupt uh, charitable giving. And so I put in my two weeks notice. I had six months of savings put aside and I thought I'm gonna give myself six months to see what I can make happen and, and just kind of go from there. And, um, and that's how um, I started on the path of soft giving. And so it originally started as like an app that was called Kickin', uh, which was really stupid. And then I decided to like up that even further by calling it Munificent, which was even like horrible. Um, I had a marketer tell me like, you don't want a drink that nobody can pronounce, or you don't want a name that nobody can pronounce after a drink of alcohol. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair. Uh, so there's like my first pitch that I gave uh, to an investor. They didn't give me any money, um, but, but my suit was dry clean, so I got a picture anyway. Um, and then I had an investor down here in Atlanta that had shown interest in, in what I was doing and had, had committed to, to writing a first, first check, like making the first investment. And so I'm like, perfect. And then like a couple weeks go by and a couple months go by and there's a big difference between getting a commitment for an investment and actually receiving the investment is what I learned. And so I thought, you know, you think I'm just gonna go away? Well, you obviously haven't seen my PowerPoint presentation yet. And so I, uh, I loaded up my car in Iowa with a couple baskets of clothes and I drove 13 hours to Atlanta moved in with this person that I met once for like 30 minutes that had uh, a spare bedroom with no natural lighting, uh, a bed with a bunch of um, springs that would dig into your back, um, and no furniture, and knew hardly anybody down here, but I was of the mindset of like, okay, like what does this person want to see? They want to see commitment. How am I going to show commitment? I'm going to move into their backyard where I can bug them every single day about writing that check. And you know what? It worked. I, I went from the first six months of not raising any money to getting a check for $100,000 for, for a company that did not exist yet. And, and that's when I decided to, to set my roots like down here in Atlanta. And so when I first started, I was working um, out of my hammock. Um, on the belt line and so every day I would get up I'd go get a cup of coffee and I'd walk out uh, to the belt line I'd throw up my hammock like between a couple trees and I would get to work uh, building my my company um, I ran into some problems when people would ask me where I was headquartered and <laughs> I'd be like oh I'm just uh, about a hundred feet south of uh, Freedom Parkway um, oh, what office space? Um, the trees. And so uh, I had to find something else. Um, so I do what any like, good entrepreneur would do, and I fired up my Bumble app and uh, went out with this one girl that was working at the Atlanta Tech Village, and she just said, you should come work at the Atlanta Tech Village. And I'm like, you make a good point. I'll go do that. <laughs> and so I applied for the Atlanta Tech Village, and, and we got in. Um, that's not their normal recruiting um, structure to get tenants, but it's the way that worked. And so um, became a tenant at the Atlanta Tech Village. And then over the, uh, the last, um, that was in the fall of 2016, uh, over the last two years, uh, what we've been doing is building, rebuilding, learning, um, trying new things, uh, 
doing, doing everything we can to uh, attack the problem of getting uh, people to give to, to nonprofits. And, and things have constantly changed and been reworked and uh, been built up again. But, uh, but as we've gone along that path, like we keep learning, we keep getting stronger, we keep figuring out you know, what the, the solution is to the problems we're trying to solve. So, um, so that's our current office space right now. Um, my desk does not look that clean um, anymore. Um, this is my team, and so there's about 10 of us now. We have four developers. Uh, we have a couple people in business development, and we have four people in marketing and operations. Uh, we support um, a little over 50 nonprofits around the country right now. Uh, we, we build um, and push out solutions almost daily. And so we have uh, become a full service uh, shop for supporting nonprofits from building the software to building the marketing for them. Um, our main solution that we have is called Change. And what Change does is you link your debit card or credit card to your favorite nonprofit and donate your rounded up change from your everyday purchases. We now have a product called Daily Change where you can donate fixed amounts daily. Uh, we are rolling out uh, social media influencer uh, marketing where uh, all those Instagram stories that you watch and you get pitched on like yoga pants and workout gear will soon be uh, having you be pitched to donate to a nonprofit. And so uh, look out for that and participate when you can. Uh, we're now working with some of the most um, respected nonprofits around the world. World Vision uh, has 45,000 employees around the world. They, um, they're the largest producer of clean water in the world. Um, CARE, uh, international, a nonprofit based here in Atlanta. The, um, they're just downtown on Ellis Street. They, um, they're where the phrase CARE package came from. And, and they support humanitarian efforts all around the world. Uh, the Woodruff Arts Center, uh, High Museum, Alliance Theater, Atlanta Symphony. Um, if you go to their website right now, and to their right now they have uh, their Change Maker program going. And if you sign up to donate your change to the Woodruff Arts Center, you get four annual passes to the High Museum and four tickets to the Alliance Theater or the Atlanta Symphony. And so it's a really great deal. So I really recommend you guys signing up. Um, it literally just costs pennies, like it's, it's no brainer. Uh, Mothers Against Drunk Driving is launching with us and they're offering free Uber rides to those people that sign up to donate their change. Uh, we're working with uh, NPRs around the country right now uh, where they're um, using us as their, their tool for, for raising uh, uh, recurring donors. And so all this stuff has just kind of continued to, to build and build and build. Uh, and, and for as, as great as all that is, like, there, there are just still constant failures like, along, the, along the way. So we've had multiple development failures where we've spent tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars on software that didn't work, uh, where we had to go back to the drawing board, and then we failed again, and then we had to go back to the drawing board again. Um, bad hires, um, you know, you... When you're a startup, you have limited resources and you try to get the best people, but sometimes that just doesn't work out. Um, getting customer needs wrong. I mean, you can do all kinds of analysis that you want when you're trying to work with a customer, but you don't really know until the rubber hits the road and they actually start using your product, like what different things you're going to need to do. Um, incorrect business models. We've changed pricing to better reflect like what we're trying to do. Delayed customer launches. Um, nonprofits. Don't even get me started. Um, um, customer champion, so you think you're about to get a sale done, and then the person that's been championing you switches and goes to like another company or another nonprofit, and then all you have to start from the beginning. Software bugs, I mean, uh, employee squabbles. But um, at the end of the day, like what I spend my day doing is balancing the needs of my employees, my investors, my customers, uh, my, my personal relationships, and like my own health needs. Um, you're, you're constantly being pulled in, in 50 different directions because everybody has something that they're trying to accomplish and it's your job to help them accomplish that goal. 
And when I first started this, and what everybody really thinks is like, oh, like when you have your own company, like it's great, you're your own boss. Um, I have like 30 bosses now. Um, I I report to to everybody else because it's my job to make sure that they're successful. And if they aren't successful, then it's my shortcomings that that are coming into effect. And so that's the that's really kind of the hidden side of like leadership is your your job is the ultimate delivery of the the product and and the successful delivery of it. And and when it comes short, like it's your responsibility to fix it. Uh, I know we're like over time a little bit, so I'll be wrapping up. But um, but at the end of the day, like with soft giving and and what all these various different experiences have have really brought is. We're, we're eliminating the silo effect of giving. And so where an individual gives to a nonprofit, where a corporation gives to a nonprofit, where a financial institution gives to a nonprofit, and, and what we're doing is we're uh, creating what's called consumer philanthropy. And so we're tying somebody's uh, purchases, uh, somebody's uh, actions into a gift being made. And so whenever you make a purchase, being able to receive a gift in return, cash back, um, event tickets, uh, gift cards, various different things, so that you, um, you as a consumer are, are receiving an immediate benefit, your nonprofit's receiving an immediate benefit, and the, the merchant, retailer, or financial institution is getting the halo effect of supporting a cause that their customers care about. And we're at the forefront of this. We are, we are doing really fantastic and amazing things in, in identifying the, the, the gaps and the obstacles to, to making it happen. Uh, we are uh, about to announce like a, a very large partnership uh, with the largest payment processor here, here in Atlanta uh, who is seeing like the work that we're doing and, and is hoping to piggyback off of the success that we're seeing and, and the vision that we have so that they can be more ingrained into uh, philanthropy. Um, it's 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 exciting times, but it's it's uh, it's also hard. And so, um, if if you choose to go down the path of being an entrepreneur, you know, it's really important that you you truly believe in what you're doing 110 percent because your metal will be tested every single day. Uh, you are going to have a thousand things that you can't control, but are responsible for and are accountable for. You uh, are going to have a vision that gets constantly knocked back and you have to regroup and, and, and charge your head forward. You have to keep a team motivated to, to share that belief and share that vision and, and push ahead forward. And, and if you don't do all those different things, like your company won't work. And so the, the margin for error is, is next, to, next to nothing. Um, my, my kind of final thoughts as we wrap up here uh, is uh, be patient, but keep moving. Like don't, don't get into uh, analysis paralysis on things. Like learn what you can, apply what you've learned, uh, experience as many different things as you can, and, and just keep progressing forward. Uh, don't fear failure because it's gonna happen every single day if you're trying to create something new. And it's just part of the learning experience and the best people are the ones that can take that and move it forward. Um, bad things will happen, guaranteed, every single day. It's okay. Um, as long as things are happening, then that's good. Um, and then just build your world. Like if you're gonna be an entrepreneur, like do, you have to get behind it in a way that you're passionate for. Like you can't take somebody else's vision and run with it. You have to really grab your own vision and have that be a part of what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And then uh, finally, um, be nice to your mother. Uh, I have a mother that really doesn't care all that much about what I'm doing. Like when I give her an update, she just says like, I'll read it later. Um, which I can't think of any more of a compliment from from mother because that means she, she knows I'm gonna be all right. <laughs> um, but, but truly, like your, your family, your friends, like those people that you surround you like, will provide that energy and, and that stopgap when, when things aren't going well and will encourage you when things are going, or when things are going bad, they'll provide the encouragement and when things are going really well, they'll be there to humble you 
and and that's what you need to to be successful. So. Um, Anyway, thank you so much for your, for your time. Uh, I don't think there's any time for questions. So thank you very much. Thanks.